We have a guest from Pakistan here at the UN, and uh, she is federal minister uh, for poverty alleviation. She is also a special assistant of Pakistan's prime minister on poverty alleviation and uh, social safety ministry, Dr. Sanya Nishta. She is here too as a lead speaker on high-level political forum event which is going on in the UN. So she will brief uh, about her presence here as well as Pakistan's social response, social and economic response, MH COVID-19 recovery, uh, dealing with the COVID-19 and how Pakistan is dealing with it. So over to Ms. Dr. Sanya Nishta. Um, good day to everyone. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to speak to all of you and I really want to thank you for uh, giving this briefing your time. Uh, I'm here for a set of meetings um, with regard to the high-level political forum uh, of ECOSOC uh, in particular, I'm here for uh, a side event which is going to happen tomorrow uh, at 9 a.m. Uh, the side event is titled uh, Social Protection and Inflection Point. Uh, and the, the permanent mission uh, of Pakistan in collaboration with the governments of Finland and Costa Rica and the United Nations and the World Bank are hosting the side event. Um, I personally feel this is a very critically important side event because COVID-19, amongst its other dire consequences, uh, has led to unspeakable hardships. Uh, and it is absolutely a um, moral imperative uh, for the world to uh, expand the base of social protection globally. So to catalyze the conversation uh, as a peg in that process, our permanent mission in collaboration with the program I run back in Pakistan called ESAS, uh, which means compassion in our local language, Urdu, is hosting this initial kickoff session tomorrow. Uh, we, had a set of, uh, we have a set of experts who are going to engage in a discourse, uh, subsequent to which we are going to decide the process um, for, for the way forward in terms of planning and in terms of coming to a conclusion on what needs to happen in terms of an institutional arrangement, in terms of uh, a set of norms, in terms of um, benchmarks that countries ought to agree upon with regard to uh, the expansion of social protection domestically. And I really hope that uh, as one of the outcomes of this discourse, we will agree upon the need to have a community of practice uh, and a peer-to-peer -peer learning platform. Because whilst I was going through the experience of uh, COVID-19 and whilst back in the country I had the responsibility of planning and executing programs, um, I felt that there was a that there really was no mechanism where I could lean on other peers for advice for. Uh, to learn from their experiences. There was no community of practice where we could share um, our, our experiences as we, uh, as, as we came across difficulties. So I think one of the things that I would really like to uh, see coming out of this meeting is the, is the need to have such an arrangement. And as I said earlier, we will use this meeting to, uh, to further the discourse on specific uh, modalities. Um, we believe back in Pakistan that social protection is not just important for support and building resilience, but that it is also a very important policy peg with respect to human capital development and furthering financial access to education, to health and nutrition. Social protection is also uh, a very important policy lever for financial inclusion, um, uh, for economic, in, uh, economic inclusion, and as a policy peg to reduce inequities. Uh, social protection also provides an economic stimulus. Uh, it helps to revive economies uh, when pursued in, at scale. Uh, and it helps to create jobs uh, as a result of um, the economic stimulus that social protection pro programs provide. So in, so in many ways, uh, it is a policy tool to further human uh, development objectives as well. Now in Pakistan, for a, 
uh, for quite some time, even before the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, social protection was a policy priority for our government. Uh, our government put in place a program called SAS, which is the boldest social protection program ever having under, uh, ever been undertaken in the history of the country. It has more than 280 programs, policies, pillars and initiatives uh, structured in four thematic pillars, uh, targeting four vulner 14 vulnerable groups. There are 34 executing agencies of the program um, uh, SRS, and it's a very ambitious program, well on its way to implementation. Uh, and in order to roll the program out, we had to create a new ministry, we had to double the budget, we had to create a digital infrastructure. So in the year 2019, we spent quite a lot of time developing this infrastructure and the program itself. And then when COVID-19 struck, we had the institutional base to uh, roll out a very large cash transfer program covering 100 million individuals. In, in terms of the percentage of population covered, this was the third largest program in the world. Um, the, uh, the, you know, United States and Japan had the largest programs in terms of percentage of population covers in, covered in ours was the third largest. Um, but, but in tandem with this cash transfer program uh, in the last year, we continued with our other planned efforts to expand the base of social protection nationally. So we expanded uh, education conditional cash transfer program nationally. We, uh, we rolled out a brand new health and nutrition conditional cash transfer program, which we are now upscaling uh, nationally. We, we expanded, our, uh, expanded our efforts to build a new uh, social registry, uh, which of course is the basis for targeting. Um, and uh, we espoused a new program, um, a, a, a policy initiative called 50% Plus, which means that 50% of all benefits under this program called SAS would accrue benefits to women. Uh, and, and a number of steps have been uh, taken in this regard. So, um, Perhaps a long-winded way of saying that back in back in our own, uh, back in Pakistan in our home base, we believe that social protection uh, is something to which there should be universal access for those that need it. Uh, this is not just something that we have espoused as policy. We are actually cascading it into implementation. We've developed the institutional infrastructure for that put solid money behind it, uh, and the investments that we made prior to COVID paid off because we had the ability, the systemic backbone, to execute a very large cash transfer program during COVID, despite the fiscal constraints we have. Uh, and now going forward, we hope to accelerate our uh, efforts even further. Uh, our experiences led us to believe uh, that it is time there should be a rallying cry um, at a global level to make a call for accelerating social protection efforts. And therefore, in, um, uh, my program in collaboration with our permanent mission in New York uh, took a lead in convening this side event. We're very glad that uh, other countries are co-hosting uh, and we hope to have uh, some very concrete actions for the way forward by the time we adjourn the meeting tomorrow. So thank you very much for joining us today uh, and very happy to respond to any questions that you may have. Yes, Dr. Sam, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Minister. My name is Ibtisam Azim from the Daily Arabic, uh, Al Arab Al Jadid. Uh, so my question to you is about the SDGs and how worried are you that uh, whether your country or other uh, countries in the global south are not going to meet them, and what do you see uh, should be done uh, in this regard, especially from uh, maybe rich country or industrial country? Thank you. So, um, so clearly SDGs is, is and should be a priority. It's just the right frame, uh, frame of reference for us uh, to be thinking in terms of as we plan to build back better once COVID be is behind us and even whilst we are fighting COVID. Uh, 
but we should be mindful of the scale of the challenge uh, because, and just to cite an example, the MDG on poverty alleviation was uh, achieved almost a decade ahead of schedule, but with the yes, corresponding SDG on poverty alleviation, we're, we're really headed backwards as, as we speak today. So clearly we should not underestimate the, 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 the size of the challenge, uh, particularly in, in a COVID context where there are fiscal constraints, unprecedented fiscal constraints, uh, and where there are other policy priorities as well. Uh, but I think that um, as countries are coming out of uh, the third wave, and hopefully there will be no other waves, uh, fingers crossed, hopefully this will be behind us soon, um, countries are beginning to realize that they should be uh, back to their normal sco scope of development uh, and the frame of references uh, of, S of SDGs to which they have all signed up is just the right goalpost to pursue. APP is the gentleman on the yeah. screen. Uh, thank you, Minister, for the uh, briefing. Uh, my question for you is that, uh, uh, globally speaking or broadly speaking, uh, what do you think are the top priorities for poverty uh, alleviation uh, in the pandemic era? Thank you. So poverty alleviation is a, is a very huge subject. And um, the, the, there are various ways through which you approach it. Then these approaches are not mutually exclusive. You can have a bottom-up approach where you consider social protection and protection of the most vulnerable as, as a way to alleviate poverty. Uh, but then on the other hand, the experience of many Asian countries uh, lead us to believe that uh, that po poverty alleviation at scale and at a certain quantum is only possible when there's massive economic growth and where, where there's capacity of governments to accrue the benefit of that growth equitably to populations, uh, which, which is the classical trickle-down effect. And I believe that both of these are not mutually exclusive. Um, and there are a whole huge set of policy actions that are relevant to alleviating poverty and suffering and protecting the vulnerable in a specific um, uh, in a specific country context. And countries, there are cash transfers, there are uh, there are care services, there are initiatives aimed at graduating individuals out of poverty. Uh, on, at the one hand of the spectrum, there are cash for work initiatives, then there are human capital initiatives centered on uh, health and education and services, essential services and water and sanitation and housing conditions, which are equally important for poverty alle alleviation. Uh, of course, there are jobs, uh, the, the importance of which cannot be underestimated in terms of poverty alleviation on a sustainable basis, and that is linked to economic growth and, um, and, and opportunities within a certain environment. Uh, and, and I genuinely think that all these dimensions of poverty alleviation are not mutually exclusive. They have to be pursued um, uh, within the same context, all at the same time, targeted at different audiences for different purposes. Thank you, Martin. Uh, Iftakhar from APP. Uh, thank you, Mariam, and, and thank you, uh, Ms. Nishtar, uh, for doing this briefing. Uh, initially, uh, we had problem online listening to you because there was some problem with the sound, but now it has improved. Uh, so my question is, uh, uh, you you uh, mentioned in your uh, intervention this morning uh, the laudable SOS prog program. Uh, what steps are you taking to bridge the digital divide in this connection so that the genuine people who are illiterate can also access uh, the, the offices? 
So Iftikhar Sahib, that's a very good question. And as I said during my statement in the morning also, that's one of the challenges we faced. Because whenever we talk about the digital divide, we think that uh, the setting up of infra infrastructure is, is something that is going to uh, be the magic wand. But that's not the case. Uh, in our country, we, we have high penetration of cell phones, good internet connectivity. Uh, but the, 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 the literacy aspect is such a strong barrier. And we, uh, we, we've, we've been consistently experiencing this uh, with the execution of the SAS program, uh, where, we, where we tend to execute uh, with a high reliance on digital technologies, basic digital technologies, use of cell phones, SMS messaging. Um, but literacy is such a major barrier. So your question, Iftikhar Sahib, was what are we doing in this respect? One of the things that we're doing is to um, invest in financial and digital literacy. And secondly, based on evidence that we've recently gathered from a, uh, from a formative analysis, we're investing uh, on children more than adults because in one of our financial and uh, digital literacy deep dives, we found out that a lot of the recipients of SAS benefits who are adults and who rely on uh, cell phone messages from our side to get the information that they need about, uh, for example, the, 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 the timing of the payments or when they're entitled to go to kiosks to collect their payments. Uh, the information that they get uh, is actually from their children, you know, from, from their girls who are in school, from the boys who are, uh, who are studying. So increasingly, our target would be uh, this younger generation who are a lot savvier with the use of uh, mobile technologies and, 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 where the, and where literacy is far higher than it is in the adult population. Hey, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Khazab. If uh, there is no other questions, so I'll thank Dr. Sanya Nishtar for her presence and valuable correspondence to come over and attend the conference. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. It's been a pleasure speaking to you. <laughs>